Hey, my name is Jesus, and I am the youth pastor here at Charlotte Assembly of God. We are so glad you are jumping on to watch the service from Sunday morning. If this is the first time you've ever tuned into our content, welcome. It is so great to have you with us. For more information about the church, our pastor, and what we believe, go to charlotteag.org or download the CAG app. Each week we gather in person and online to align our hearts in our mission to love God, love people, and live to serve. I hope as you watch this video, you grow closer to Christ and live to love others better. So grab a cup of coffee and your Bible as we dive deep into this week's message. We have amazing people who serve Sunday after service and tech and sound and children's ministry with the youth, um, our safety team, our hospitality team, and just the presence of God in this room. You guys are excited to be here, excited to um, hear the word this morning. And yes, it's because of God, but we have an amazing pastor that has brought this all together. And Pastor Shane is sending his love from Dallas. He's on vacation visiting his dad. I'm so excited for him to be able to be in the sun. I'm a little jealous, but I'm excited that he is relaxing and getting to spend some time with his dad. But the presence of God is because we have a great pastor who wants the presence of God here. The maturity that you'll find in our people, the friendliness that you'll find in our people is because of the man that God has appointed for this church. Doesn't mean you can't listen to me today. I might have a word or two you might want to hear. <laughs> um, but I'm excited to be with you. I'm excited to bring this message to you. Kind of interesting, I'm not, I wasn't supposed to preach. Um, I found out Friday morning, Pastor Jesus uh, came down with some kind of cough, sickness, flu, whatever, I don't know. And so I was like, okay, God, what are we doing? <laughs> and I'm just thankful that he had started to put something on my heart and I was able to spend time in his presence and bring it together. So the message of my, the title of my message is, and safety team, you might need to lock down the doors when I say this, but I don't want anybody to leave. Where is your boldness Monday through Saturday? Yeah, lock those doors. Don't let anybody out. Please stay. <laughs> so I heard a story about a man who went to the zoo. And he was standing in front of the lion cage. When one of the zoo workers walked into where the lion was, and he had nothing in his hands but a broom. And he closed the door behind him. And this man was just looking like, what in the world is he doing? And he proceeded to sweep the floor. So the man watching got wor worried because the worker didn't have any weapons, didn't have anything to defend himself. If the lion decided he was hungry and wanted to attack. But the worker just didn't seem to notice. He just kept sweeping the ground. In fact, at one point, he poked the lion to move so he could sweep in the corner. And this guy was just watching this whole thing unfold in front of his eyes, you know, and he's like probably standing there gripping the, the fence and his eyeballs were getting bigger and bigger. And finally he couldn't take it anymore and he said, you are a brave man. And the worker looked up and said, no, I ain't brave. And he just kept sweeping. Well, the guy watching said, that must just be a tame lion, right? No, he ain't tame said the worker. Well, if you aren't brave and that lion isn't tame, then I don't understand why he doesn't attack you. The worker just chuckled and said, Mister, he's old and he ain't got no teeth. <laughs> there are some situations in our lives that don't require much boldness. But there are a lot of situations we have to face. And in a figurative sense, there are lions that we all have to face that do have teeth. Very, very sharp teeth. And because of this, you will need boldness. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this opportunity just to share with my CAG family 
Lord, I just ask that everything that I say would be what you want me to say. Lord, that you would anoint the words, that you would prepare the hearts and open the ears, that they would take this message to heart. Lord, that it wouldn't just be a message that would go uh, be like for the person sitting next to them or the another house that's watching from home. But that we would sit and be like, okay, God, is this me? Are you talking to me? Lord, just you take over this morning and you do what you want to do. In Jesus' name, we all say amen. Oh, you guys are good. The boys and girls, when I do that, they shout amen, and I love it. So that was really cool. Made me feel at home like I can relax here. <laughs> so for the most part, when we come to church on Sunday and we have a wonderful worship set like that, we feel like we're filled up. We're like, we can conquer the world. We have all this boldness. We have all this energy, right? And we're like, okay, God, I'm going to do this. And then we wake up Monday. And then things don't go right. Either our alarm doesn't go off or, you know, the breakfast burned. We got yelled at it by our boss. We failed a test at school. And it seems like all of that boldness that we thought we had on Sunday went right out the window. And do we ignore the promptings throughout the week because we're too busy? Oh, God, I can't do that. I'm too busy. I got to run the kids to, to the baseball, softball. Lord, I, I got to clean the floors. They're dirty. I got to take out the trash. And we ignore the promptings of the Holy Spirit to step out in boldness. Or we're afraid. <laughs> There's no way I can do that. I, w I had Kim and Mike over yesterday, and, and I said something like, I'm nervous. And they go, what? Yes. Even Pastor Shane has told me he is nervous sometimes when he gets up. Just, just switch places with me for a minute. And think how it feels to stand here with all of you people just staring at you. <laughs> it's nerve-wracking. It takes boldness to step out. It takes boldness. Or sometimes we think, I'm not qualified. I can't do this. I don't know enough. I'm not anointed enough. My dad got saved on a Wednesday night. He preached his first sermon on a Sunday with only knowing one scripture. You're qualified. You're qualified. Every single person in this room is qualified. There are passages in Paul's letters where he talks about his own boldness. And he tells us that we as Christians need to be bold. So in Ephesians 3.12, Paul says this. We have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Who gives us our boldness? You could talk back to me. It's okay. Who gives us our boldness? Yeah. Same. Very good answers. Jesus, God. In Acts 4, the Jewish leaders saw the boldness of Peter and John. Later in the same chapter, Acts 4, 29, the apostles prayed for boldness. I like that. They prayed for boldness. A lot of us get caught up, oh, I don't have boldness. I can't, I can't do that. I can't step out. I can't do what God's putting on my heart. Have you stopped to pray and ask for the boldness for what God has placed upon your heart? Every person in this room has something that God is laying upon their heart to do. There is no exception. There is no exception. We all have something that God wants us to do. Acts 4.31 says they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. They were able to continue to do this because they prayed. Wednesday night prayer is powerful, guys. If you can't find time during the week to pray, which I hope that's not the case, make sure you come out to Wednesday night prayer. You'll get filled up. You'll get that boldness. You'll be able to step out. In Acts 9, Barnabas said that Paul preached boldly in the name of Jesus. 
I can stand before you this morning and preach with confidence, with boldness, because of Jesus who lives inside of me. Not because I have any special gifting or anything supernatural, uh, other than Jesus, of course. But it's Jesus in me. It's God in me that gives me the ability to stand here. In chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly. That's Acts 13, 46. In chapter 14, they were speaking boldly for the Lord. When you get really connect to the Lord and you really know what it is he's calling you to do, it does get a little easier. It's that first step that's hard. How many of you guys have, have ever really done anything extra special? I shouldn't have done something that God has laid on your heart, right? You've stepped out. Isn't it that first step? It's like you'll worry about it until that moment, and then you take that step. You make that phone call. You invite that person over. You get up and speak, or you have a circle. It's the, the first step. Breck, the first united steps. Were you nervous? But it's gotten easier, right? Because you know it's God directing you. In Acts 18, Apollos began, um, Apollos began to speak boldly in the synagogue. That's Acts 18.25. And I could go on with more and more verses, but I think you get the idea. There was a lot of boldness in the book of Acts. The early Christians had this bold faith that led them to speak boldly and take bold actions that led to some bold results. We read it, right? We read it in Acts. We read it in the, in the New Testament. In Acts 17, people said that the early Christians were those folks who have turned the world upside down. That's Acts 17.6. And you might be sitting there thinking, yeah, but those guys walked with Jesus. Those guys were intimate with him. What happened this morning? Wasn't that an intimate moment with Christ? Wasn't he able to share his heart with you, wrap his arms around with you, love you, encourage you? And we don't just have to do that on Sunday morning. You could have those moments with God Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Therefore, you can have boldness Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. This is what God wants us to do, to turn Charlotte upside down. To turn Eaton County upside down. Martin Luther King once warned against the church being bastions of the status quo. That means upholding the norm. I don't want the norm. Do you want the norm? Think about what your work is like. Think about what the world is like. Turn on the, the TV and watch the news. That's the status quo. Is that what you want? God needs your boldness. We need to be a group of people who allow God's spirit to work in us and through us and lead us wherever he wants us to go. But here's the clincher. We can't expect any bold results unless we're willing to be a bold people. I'm going to say that again. We can't expect any bold results unless we're willing to be a bold people. You can't sit in that chair and say, oh, Pastor Shane will do it. Robin will do it. Uh, Pastor Jesus, they'll, they'll do it. They'll change Eaton County. We're a church family. We have to do this together. God needs my boldness, yes, but he needs your boldness as well. He needs you to step out. He needs you to connect with people. And I'm going to break this down because you're probably thinking there, well, I'm not going to get up and preach. I'm not, I'm not exactly talking about that. And I'm going to break it down because there are things that every single person in this room can do and should be doing. 
So before we go any further, I want to stop and define what I mean by boldness. If you look this word up in the dictionary, you'll find that boldness is defined as a willingness to take risks and act innovatively. Confidence and courage. Some of you would read that and be like, hmm, okay, that's fine. But that's what you need. That's what you should have. We need that in our jobs. We need that in our relationships. We need that in our day-to-day -day life, raising our kids. It takes boldness to raise kids. <laughs> okay. Someone once said, and my microphone's falling off, so forgive me, sorry. Someone once said that Christian boldness contains three elements. Conviction, courage, and urgency. And if any one of these ingredients are missing, then we won't act boldly. Without sufficient conviction that something ought to be said or done, then what's there to be bold about? Without sufficient courage, we don't have enough strength in our conviction to face opposition or threats. And without a sufficient sense of urgency, we lack the fire under our feet to get us moving. People who are half-hearted or fearful or, or indifferent are by definition not bold. But I want to look at that for just a minute. Conviction. If you're sitting in here and you have surrendered your life to Jesus, if you are a follower of God and you have a relationship of Jesus, then you should have the conviction to be bold. Because what did God tell us to do? Go. Go. Go and make disciples. But we got to go. We got to move. We got to do we got to be bold. But we should have that conviction. The, I'm going to skip to urgency. We should have urgency by just living life and seeing what condition our world's in. Are you guys awake? Have you guys turned on the news? <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> But we know what's happening in our world, right? We, we see it. We're faced with it. There should be an urgency in us that we want to see a change. That we want to see God turn Eaton County upside down. We don't want to stop there, though, right? We want the world turned upside down. But let's first go ahead. I like that. <laughs> but first, we need to go. We need to step. We need to move. But you might be sitting there thinking, but, but Robin, what am I doing? What should I do? I can't go through and tell each and every one of you what to do. But I can tell you this. If you get silent and quiet in God's presence, he'll drop things into your heart. And don't push them out. It could be as simple as bake a pie and go to your neighbor's house. What if that person needs to hear about Jesus? Don't you want to be the person to bring it? Don't you want to be that person that brings the good news to your neighbor who is hurting? Yeah. You have a choice this morning. You could sit there and say, oh, that Pastor Robin, she has a crazy high voice. and But she's fun to listen to. Or you could say, oh, wow. I want to make a difference. I want to be somebody for, for God. We're going to look at some people in the Bible, and, and these people aren't people that you have not heard of. They're going to be stories that you're pretty familiar with, but I want you to think about them in a different um, way today. The first person we're going to talk about, Esther. The boldness to take a big risk. Let's think about Esther here for a minute. Young girl, raised in a Jewish family, just probably doing her thing, probably had plain clothes, 
Didn't really have fancy hair, fancy makeup. But she catches the eye of the king. And they whisk her away. Even in that, wouldn't that be scary? Leaving your family, leaving your friends, leaving everything that you know. And now you're living in this palace. And I kind of think of it this way, like, you know, beauty regiments of today, right? You're soaking in a tub, you're getting your nails done, your hair done, your makeup done, you know. To me, that's kind of fun. But you know what? If they weren't really talking to her, they weren't really explaining things to her, she had no clue what was happening. They, they were definitely making her look pretty. They were beautifying her. But she was still this young girl. I like to say 16. I'm not sure if that's exactly right. But 16. Living in this castle. No friends, no family. And then the king says, I want you to be my queen. Whew. Whew. Even in that, that's scary. That's like, oh, God, what, what are we doing here? But then her uncle comes to her. Mordecai says, hey, Esther, I need you to do something. You know, Haman's trying to destroy our family. He's trying to destroy the Jews. I need you to do something. She's 16. She's not living with her mom and dad and family and getting encouragement every day and getting positive strokes. She's living with women that are catty. Have we thought about that? Yeah, women can be, not me, of course, I'm not catty. <laughs> but she's living with women that are probably, they don't want Esther to be queen. They want to be queen. But now here's Mordecai saying, Esther, I need you to do me a favor. She knew what that favor meant. Let's read in Esther 4.16. Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. And do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. She knew exactly what it meant to go before the king. For the, those of you who might not know the story... If you went before the king without him asking for you to come, he could ask for you to be executed. You could die. She's 16. She's living in a palace that she doesn't know anybody. She had the boldness to take a risk. So whatever God is putting on your heart, think about that. Could, could I? Could I be like Esther? Because of her faithfulness, because of her boldness, she saved the Jewish people at that time. Just think what you can do. Because you can. Nobody here is um, less than Esther. I think sometimes we glorify these people. She was a young girl. Who just listened and obeyed and had the boldness to do it. So will you have the boldness to take a big risk? Because it will take a big risk. Next person we're going to talk about is Moses. The boldness to face the past. Again, I told you these stories that I'm bringing to you are stories that you probably have heard time and time again. We all know that Moses killed a man. And he ran from Egypt because of it. He started a whole new life. He had a family. He was now a shepherd. I think he was probably pretty content Till one day, a bush was burning. But it wasn't actually burning up. So curiosity, how many of us are very curious? Okay, my feet and everything is raised. I'm very curious. 
Moses probably walked over and was like, it's on fire, but there's still leaves. Nothing's burning. And then can you imagine like standing there and all of a sudden hearing, Moses. <laughs> I think I probably would have ran, <laughs> hid. But he probably was so scared to death he stood right there. And here Moses told him that he was going to send him back to Egypt. I can just hear the whole conversation in my brain, right? Um, God, no. I can't do that. Like, first of all, I stutter. Your brother will speak for you. Okay. Well, but then, you know, um, I killed a man. They're probably going to, you know, arrest me, throw me in the dungeon. God's like, no, I'm going to take care of that. Think about that for a minute. Because I, I think sometimes we read through the Bible and we don't stop long enough. They didn't have TV. They didn't have video games. They didn't have um, really much to do. I mean, they had a lot to do. But, like, they sat around and told stories and relayed things that happened. So do you think the story of Moses killing someone got forgotten? It took Moses great courage to go back to Egypt, to face his past, to face his fears. Let me read Exodus 3, 11 through 12. He said, but I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Moses had courage to face his past because he knew God was going with him. How many of you have heard an amazing scripture that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you? It doesn't say, Robin, or Pastor Shane, I will never leave you or forsake you. Or Bethany, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's talking to each and every one of us. Honestly, I, I don't know what's in your past. Moses killed a man and God used him. So it doesn't really matter what's in your past. We kind of hold on to, oh God, but uh, you know, you know what I've done. You know where I've been. You've known what I've said. Yes, he knows those things. But he can use them. And he can Forgive them. He has, if you've asked. So those things don't get in his way. Are you going to let those things get in your way? Are you going to have the boldness to face your past? The next person I want to talk about is David. We all know David and Goliath, you know, that's kind of cool, the three stones, and we learn about it in Sunday school. But David had the boldness to face impossible situations. He was young. Could, took care of the sheep. Probably smelled like sheep. Right? Just, just a young kid. Do, do any of us ever think, well, I can't do that. I don't have the right clothes to wear or I don't have the right look. Or, you know, I used to say, but my voice is really weird and squeaky. <laughs> God can use us. God wants to use us. We just have to have the boldness. So here's David. I, I love this because, you know, David, God really prepared David. So before ever arriving in King Saul's camp, God had already helped him defeat a lion and a bear. And I'm sh pretty sure he knew that it was God that helped him do that, that he didn't do it on his own. Because he's, he's a young man. So he knew God helped me do this. God supported me. God gave me the strength to do this. So he walks into the, the um, 
King Saul's camp. And all the Israelite soldiers are hanging out. And he hears Goliath taunting them, teasing them, criticizing his God. And a holy boldness rose up within David. Young boy. He didn't have all the training of those soldiers. He didn't have the armor of those soldiers. He didn't have the the ability to, you know, what am I trying? Sword, that's what that thing is. (laughs) He didn't have the ability to use that sword. But he had holy boldness and he was, I'm sure this, like, I can kind of see it again. I like to break down these stories as you can tell, right? I like to really think about them. And I'm like, he probably walked into that camp, heard Goliath saying what he was saying, and was like, you're not going to talk to my God about my God that way. And he went stomping into to King Saul's tent saying, I'll take him down. I'll do it. Are we going to do that? Are we going to do that? Are we going to have boldness in impossible situations? God's waiting for us. We know the, the, I want to read this to you. It's uh, 1 Samuel 17, 32 to 33 and 37. And David said to Saul, Let's no, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth. Do you want anybody to say that about you guys? You can't do that because you're young. No. You're going to say, no way, I could do it because I'm young. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Do we even pause for a minute and think how much boldness it took for David to walk into King Saul's tent? He probably had to go past guards. He probably had to make up, you know, some excuse. They probably didn't want to let him in to see see King Saul. So he even had to have boldness there. He even had to have creativity there. But he knew that with God's help, he could do the impossible. With God's help, we can do the impossible. I do want to just stop on David for just a second here. I want you to see this. God prepared him. Right? He didn't just wake up one day and go into the camp and defeat Goliath. He was faithful to do what God had him to do, taking care of those sheep, and he defeated a lion. And he continued. How many of us would be like, I'm not doing that job anymore, God. I need another job. But he continued to do what God had in front of him, and then God's And then he defeated the bear. I'm not going to say God sent the bear because he didn't. But he defeated the bear because of God. There's a progression here. And there was, I believe God will prepare you for what it is that he wants you to do. I was was thinking, and I've told this story to some people, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. But I was working as a house mother for a drug and... Um, alcohol abuse center for women and if anybody's familiar there's a lot of time there's nightmares in the night right and um, I got lots of stories but I'm not going to go into them because God met me like every step of the way while I was there but anyway one night I woke up to a really weird sound and I went into the living room and there was this young girl crouched behind a house plant and as I drew closer, she was growling, (laughs) and her face was quite distorted. I knew exactly what was happening. I was young, (laughs) and I was afraid. (laughs) So I called the director, 2 a.m. in the morning, and she's like, I'll be right there. By the time she got there, you know, I just sat there and prayed, and, but by the time she had gotten there, the activity, demonic activity, had had left. And so I had a choice. I could be ignore it and just pray, God, never let that happen again. But I went home and I said, Dad, Mom, what do I need to do? 
and they gave me some books. And I prayed, and I studied, and I learned. And about two weeks later, the same thing happened. And I walked in there with boldness. The Holy Spirit came upon me, and I commanded that demon to leave, and it left. But I'm kind of saying two things here. He prepared me. He will prepare you. But I still had to have boldness. So he will. You might think, oh, I hear this all the time. I could never teach a circle. Yes, you can. <laughs> yes, you can. I could never work with children. Yes, you can. We just have to be obedient to what God is putting in our heart. We're the church. We're the body. If we're going to see Eaton County turn upside down, we need boldness. We need to step out. We need to do this. Then I'm going to tell you about Joseph. I love Joseph. I love the story of Joseph. He had the boldness to wait. So we, again, how many of you know the story of Joseph? At least read it a couple times, heard it in Sunday school, something like that. Nobody over here? Come on, you guys are like, yeah, okay. You just didn't want to wave, wave, raise your hand at me. <laughs> um, I want to read this to you before I tell the story. Genesis 37, and I'm going to read 6 through 7 and then 9. He said to them, hear this dream that I have had. This is Joseph. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheave arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheave. Hmm. Think about being his brothers. Then in verse 9, Joseph said, Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. Now, we know the story. We know his brothers got mad. His father was like, what in the world? Who do you think you are that we're going to bow down to you? But you know what? Joseph knew that was from God. Joseph knew that he had had a dream that was given by God. Guess what? The next day, nobody bowed down to him. They didn't. Actually, it took a long time. Right? We know this. His, his brothers got angry, got jealous, got envious. Not just because he had the dream. Then his father gives him a coat. and you, We know that story, right? He goes to bring food to his brothers and his brothers plot to kill him. He, thank God he had one brother that said, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in a ditch, in a hole, in a pit. Nice brothers. Hopefully none of you have brothers or sisters like that. The worst I ever had, my sisters threw me in the shower. <laughs> I, they did, with all my clothes on too. You want to know? Oh, I shouldn't. I'm going to have to say it now. But I was, I was a little stinker. And I stayed in my wet clothes until my parents got home so they would get in trouble. <laughs> See, I'm not, I'm not perfect <laughs> by any means. They throw them in the pit. Do you put yourself in Joseph's shoes. They're supposed to be bowing down to me. They just threw me in a pit. God, what's happening here? Then he gets set, sold into slavery, and he's a slave in Potiphar's house. And he's way away from his brothers. And he's probably like, God, how in the world are they going to bow down to me now? They're a million miles away. He still had faith. He still continued his walk with the Lord. He didn't, well, God, you didn't answer my prayer. Nobody bowed down to me yet. I'm out of here. I'm not serving you anymore. No, he stayed faithful. He continued to be bold, right? He had to be bold in that house to be able to work his way up, that he was the head of the household of Potiphar. He was probably thinking, okay, it's going to happen soon. My brothers somehow, God's going to bring my brothers. They're going to bow down to me. No. We know Potiphar's wife, not a very nice lady, lied. He goes to prison. He 
he's in prison. I'm sure it's not like our prisons where you get three meals a day and a comfy bed and TV and a gym to work out in. I'm not saying prison's nice. But it was nothing like back then, I'm sure. Joseph's in prison. He could have been like, okay, God, I'm done with you now. Forget this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have, I'm just done. No. He stayed faithful. He continued to do what was right. He continued to be kind. He continued to help those around him. What happened? He found favor with the guards. And eventually, Pharaoh had a dream. Nobody could interpret. God gave Joseph the interpretation. Again, it takes boldness for him to go in front of Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh his dream. Especially since he knew what that dream meant. Can you just imagine that? Telling Pharaoh, uh, your kingdom is in trouble. He waited a long time. To get to stand before Pharaoh. I wonder how many of us would wait that long. And continue to be faithful. And continue to have boldness. And continue to follow Jesus. Waiting that long. And we know the rest, right? He tells Pharaoh the dream. He becomes the number one man in Egypt. And his brothers eventually come to get wheat and corn or whatever. Whatever crop they needed back then. And they bowed down to him. The dream came true. It wouldn't have if, it, if he didn't have that boldness. We need that boldness. The last one I'm going to tell you about, and I wasn't, it's actually not on our slides, William, so don't get nervous because I just added this yesterday morning. I was at Circle yesterday morning and we were talking about Mary Magdalene. And as I was sitting there, I was like, Whoa, she was bold. So let, let me just set this up for you. So we're going to talk about boldness in grief. Boldness in grief. Sometimes, well, we all have probably gone through times of sadness, loss, grief. And we have a choice of giving up or remaining faithful and remaining bold. Mary Magdalene. Followed the Lord. We know she had a close relationship with the Lord. We know that she funded his ministry. That's how much she believed in, in God, in Jesus. The day after he was put in the tomb, he, she needed to do something. I'm sure she was grieving. I'm sure she was sad. I'm sure she felt hopeless and lost. One of her very best friends had just been murdered, brutally murdered. But she had a job to do. She had to prepare his body. She had to anoint him. She had to embalm him. And that was a woman's duty back then. She had to be bold in her grief to go to that tomb. Again, picture it. She's, she's probably crying all night long. Think about a loss that you have had. It racks you. Wrecks you. Right? It does. But she still went. She still did what she needed to do. And when she got there, it says in Mark 20, 11 through 12, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she sto stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had laid, one at the head and one at the feet. She was the very first person to see the angels, and the angels told her that Jesus was alive. Even in her grief, even in your grief, you can have boldness. Even in your grief, you can step out. Even in your grief, God will direct you. And it is my desire... That God would take this church and that God would give us courage. That God would give us an outspoken spirit. That God would give us the willingness to live for him without being afraid. So will you be like or do you need to be like Esther and have boldness to take a big risk? 
Or Moses, a boldness to face your past. How about David and have boldness to face impossible situations? Maybe you need to have the boldness to wait like Joseph. And many of us need to be like Mary Magdalene and have boldness in the midst of our grief. You see, here's the deal. God loves to take ordinary people and give them extraordinary boldness. I'm going to say that again. God loves to take ordinary people, just like every person in this room, and give them extra, extraordinary boldness. He loves to take people. If you want to clap, you can clap. <laughs> he loves to take people that others overlook and give them boldness. And I'm sure a lot of you are going to say, yes, those, those people you talked about, Robin, they were bold, but they were in the Bible. They were supposed to be bold. We're talking about Esther, Moses, David, the apostles, and Joseph. I can't compare to them. I'm not a Bible teacher. I'm just a stay-at-home mom, or I'm just a student, or I'm just a soldier, or maybe I'm just an ordinary guy. But there are so many different ways to be bold. I hope I don't embarrass. But look at what Olivia did this morning. She had the boldness to come up here and do the announcements. Didn't she do a great job? That took boldness. How many of you, if I said, hey, how many would like to do announcements next week? How many of you would raise your hand? Oh, see, see, oh, go, look at these bold young people. I'm proud of you guys. <laughs> um, maybe you're in your workplace and everybody is gossiping. And you say, you know what? Because of my faith, I'm not going to be a part of this. And you walk away from gossip. That's being bold. Or maybe you're a teenage girl and you love God, but you also love your friends. And your friends are all caught up in the latest fashions, but we know the latest fashions could be kind of skimpy. And you say, you know what? I'm going to be modest because I want to honor God. And your friends make fun of you. Don't you want to be fashionable? Don't you want to wear this? And you say, I care more about honoring God than being fashionable. That's being bold. Or maybe you're a guy and you're single and you're meeting all these cute girls and but you're kind of going from one girl to another girl to another girl and you're kind of using those girls as playthings. You're not honoring them the way God would want you to honor them. You're treating them like objects. And you finally decide, you know what? I'm going to treat women the way God wants me to treat women. And I'm going to honor them. I'm sure your fellows, your guy friends would make fun of you. But you know what? When you stand up and do that, you're being bold. Or maybe you're in a business deal and you could make a lot of money on a certain business deal, but you're looking at the deal and you're saying, hmm, something's not quite right. Actually, I don't think this is quite ethical. And you walk away from a very profitable business deal because of your faith. That's being bold. I want you to understand that God gives ordinary people extraordinary boldness. That includes everybody in this room. So there's a, how many of you guys know I like to cook? <laughs> Some of you. I know Pastor Shane talks about it sometimes. But there's a show that I, I do watch, and it's uh, the um, Chopped. Anybody ever seen Chopped? So um, on Chop, they compete, and the winner gets to take home $10,000, and they have to cook whatever's in this basket. So seven years ago, there was an episode on Chopped, and one of the contestants was a Christian, and his name was Lance Nitihara. 
Nitihara. That's a weird name. But anyway, I think I said it. Hopefully I didn't butcher it. Throughout the show, he talked about how his life had changed. He used to be mean. He used to be very inconsiderate. And he mentioned how his life had changed because of God. And he even ended up praying for one of the girls while he was on the show. Lance's chief competitor in the show came down to two people, Lance and this girl named Yoan. And Yoan was there hopefully wanting to win the money so that she could go visit her grandmother in France who was dying. But at the end of the show, it was Lance who won the $10,000. And right at the end, he turned to Yoan and he said, I didn't expect to win, so I'm giving you the $10,000 to go visit your grandmother. I'm paying for your ticket. To the amazement of everyone there, the judges, the audience, Lance did something bold and he gave away his prize money because that's what God directed him to do. Because an ordinary guy took a moment to live like Jesus Christ and have boldness. The worship team can come back. I'm going to tell you this last story and then we're going to close this morning. So my sis, I was telling my sister, you know, again, I found out yes Friday morning that I was preaching and I called Naylene and, and I'm like, nay, I gotta preach. God's been kind of putting this idea in my heart. What do you think? And she's like, oh, Robin, something happened to this lady at our church. And so this lady at her church, um, just an ordinary mom. Do you like how I said that? Our moms are extraordinary. She was a stay-at-home mom, and she was running to the grocery store, and as she was running into the grocery store, she saw a homeless lady right outside. She didn't really think anything until she got in the store, and she decided that she, um, she started thinking about this lady, and she felt like God told her to buy groceries for that lady. So she bought groceries for the lady, and she was, also, she was at Walmart, so she's like, you know what, I'm going to buy a Bible. And she got the Bible, and she put her name and phone number in the Bible. Now, a lot of you are like, I'm not doing that. She could have been a crazy person. And she could have been. But she was listening to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And we need to listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. So she went out, gave the groceries to the lady, gave the Bible to the lady, and said, if you ever need anything, my name and number's in the front of the Bible. Call me. This just happened. The lady ended up calling her two days later and said, I'd like to go to church, but I don't want to go by myself. Will you go with me? And the lady said, sure, I'll go with you. It was last Sunday, Easter. And the lady didn't want to bring her to her church, not because she didn't want to be seen with her, but she wanted to take her to a church close by where she lived so she could walk there. So the lady missed Easter Sunday with her family at her church, and she went to church with this lady. Sat there with this lady, probably picked her up. Think about the homeless people. We usually just walk by them. They're not there. If I don't look, they don't exist, right? The lady got saved. The lady got saved. All because an ordinary, wonderful, amazing mom listened to the Holy Spirit. When you step out in boldness, when you listen to God's heartbeat and you listen to what he's asking you to do, people might not appreciate it. People might even think you're crazy, but they will be amazed. They will notice what you have done, and they will see a strong conviction in you. And they'll see a person who is willing to live out their faith regardless of the consequences. God wants to take you, an ordinary person, and give you boldness to, get, to do extraordinary things. Thanks for watching. If you have a prayer request or more questions about God or the church, go to charlotteag.org.
and hit the connect tab so we can be in contact with you. We hope you have experienced the life-changing love of Jesus Christ through this message. If you are looking to get connected, one easy way is to join us at 7 p.m. on Wednesday nights as we pray. And don't worry, because there is a place for your child or student as well. Have a blessed day, and may Christ's love shine upon you.